Well, good morning, Crossroads. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? All right. Uh, it is really good to be here today. I'm so glad that we've all been able to come and gather to worship Jesus. Come on now, who's excited to be here? I, I can't think of a better place to be on Sunday morning where we get together and worship together as a family. Let's give a shout out to everybody in Mishawaka, everybody in St. Pete, everybody in Nashville, everybody who's joining online. Uh, if you're online, dress code is sweatpants and a t-shirt. There you go. You did it. Well done. Maybe some popcorn. I don't know how exactly that works for everybody, but I mean, it works for me. That, that works. Uh, we are wrapping up our series today, Creatures of Habit, and honestly, I, I want to lean into this today because we're talking about uh, something that is really, really important that maybe doesn't seem very relevant when we first talk about the topic itself, and yet I, I would contend today that it's never been more relevant than it is now. We're, we're actually talking about the topic of idolatry today, and you're like, idolatry? What, what is that all about? We don't have idols. Well, here's one. Uh, so, no, no. Uh, this represents the trophy that is given to the winner of our church staff and board fantasy football league. Just give it up to our church staff, uh, to the board members of Crossroads. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say it says 2016 champion Tim Fisher. Look at that. How about that? How did that happen? Uh, that's amazing. Uh, we got a couple of multiple winners. Ashley LeCount. Give it up for Ashley. Yeah. Keith Pidzinski, a back-to-back -back champion. Uh, this year, the winner, uh, really honestly, by pure luck, uh, Troy Forrest. Give it up for Troy Forrest. Uh, the first the first person to win who is a board member. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. Uh, give it up to Troy. And honestly, I am having a hard time because of the way the season ended. I'm having a hard time looking at this for very much longer. So would you give it up for Ralph as he comes up and just takes this trophy away? And then we'll present that to Troy at a later time. Ralph, thank you. <laughs> no, and Ralph, your name is not on there. You're correct. <laughs> You've been in the league every year, though, Ralph. Maybe we'll get a, one of those participation trophies for you. So, yeah. <laughs> uh. Idols, let's talk about this for a second. Idols, uh, I think in the olden days, in the Bible times, we could recognize that there were moments where the people of God, the Israelites, would actually make for themselves idols that they worshiped, right? There was an image, whether it was just a statue or a cow or whatever it was, they would form these images and they would worship them. And we're like, Tim, we don't do that today. And I think you're right. We probably don't do that for the most part. I think the struggle that we have to recognize and to be able to, to be willing to lean into today is that today when we talk about our idols, when we talk about this, this problem of idolatry, we don't worship idols that are made of something physical. The, the idols that we serve are in our hearts. They're harder to see. They're harder to identify because at the end of the day, they, they creep into our lives. And many times we don't even recognize that we've been serving that idol until we just kind of have that aha moment. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will convict us. Sometimes we will resist that voice of God in our lives, challenging us to change our ways. And yet, it's, it's very important that we just be willing to be honest with ourselves, that we, we take the chance from time to time to just stop and listen to the, to the word of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and to acknowledge, hey, maybe there is something in my life that has become an idol. So let's talk about what that means. What is an idol? Let's define that today. An idol is anything that has been created that we exchange for the creator, can we just stop and, and consider the ramifications of that for a moment? I'm going to say that again. It is anything that's been created that we exchange for the creator. So instead of worshiping God, the creator God, I, I begin finding myself centering my life around something that he created. And in our society today, I think some of them are pretty obvious. We chase after money, chase, chase after fame and fortune. We, we chase after pleasure. Sometimes it's, it's comfort that we seek after. Sometimes it's just the idol of sports or travel or even politics becomes our idol. It's whatever in our minds that consume us and, and become more important to us than God. We find ourselves worshiping the created rather than the creator. Uh, Tim Keller says this, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. It's when I replace my pursuit of Jesus and, and having him be first, and, and when the created thing becomes the thing that I worship instead of the creator, that I find myself having an idol in my life. 
Remember, idols are not those things we create that are physical. It's something that's in my heart. And at the end of the day, I want you to know today that God cares about your heart more than anything else. And, and when we get these things confused in our lives, when, when the wrong thing is the priority in our lives, man, it, it has devastating ripple effects on our relationship with God. I would challenge you today that you cannot fully live into the calling that God has placed on your life, the purpose and the plan that he has for you, if you aren't pursuing him first, if something else has taken that highest place of importance in your life. And oh, by the way, I think that, you know, let's just use money as an example. If if your life is focused on the career and that pursuit of money and chasing that, It's not only your relationship with God that gets hurt. Oftentimes, your relationship with your family, your relationships with your friends, they also get hurt as well. There's a devastating ripple effect when we allow these these things that have been created, you know, take the place of the creator in our lives. Paul speaks to this in Colossians 3, and he's pretty blunt. And I I have to be honest, we're going to have some fun today. We're going to laugh a little bit and have a good time, but it's also going to get intense. So just get ready for that. We're going to have an intense moment. It's, it's going to get real, okay? So, is anybody excited about that at all? Like, yeah, let's go, let's go. We're going to have fun, but we're going to get real. And, and Paul gets real here. He says, listen, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you claim that, man, I have put my trust in Jesus, I have decided to follow him. If that's, if that's who you are, if that's the claim that you make, Paul says this, so put to death the sinful earthly things that are lurking within you, in your heart. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. See, Paul's circling the same thing. You're worshiping the things that have been created instead of worshiping the creator. You've allowed those things to creep into your life and take that highest spot of priority. And when you do that, you're going down a dangerous path. And I think that we just have to be honest. We have to analyze our lives. Where am I spending my time? What is that one thing in my life that if I took that away, it would terrify me? I mean, the next generation is like, Wi-Fi? Don't take away my (laughs) Wi-Fi. Maybe that's my generation too. Wi-Fi, that's a big one. That thing that you would take away in your life that would terrify you. That thing that you spend so much time on that it's taking your focus away from Jesus. I think we've got to be honest and and be okay admitting, all right, I've allowed some things to, to creep into my life, some habits to form that have started taking my priority and my focus off of Jesus. And you know, a lot of times, let me be clear, the things that become idols are not always bad things, but they're things that just start consuming our time and begin pushing Jesus out, giving him less time in our lives. So I just want you to consider what's the margin? What's the balance? What are the boundaries that maybe you need to set on some things in your life to make sure that God has that that highest place of priority in your life? It's interesting to me uh, that when we look at the the Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20, the first three directly uh, involve our relationship with God. The first three commands that God gives us actually speak to this topic of idolatry. And so when you look at the first one, it, you know, God says to Moses, you must not have any other God but me. I mean, that, that's the first thing he says. I mean, you talk about just naming it. This is idolatry. You must not have any other God but me. It, my life, if I'm going to follow Jesus, it has to be centered around him. Everything in my life flows through him. God demands that he is the highest priority in our lives. I mean, you think about it in terms of like an organizational flow chart, right? Like, well, in my life, God needs to be at the top of that flow chart, and everything can, goes through him. I, I would say you can even blow up that mind. I think God is the organizational flow chart. Like, it's, it's all him, okay? We talk about the idea of like having a, a board that runs the, the company, and they make the decisions. You're like, well, God is the chairman of the board. No, no, God sits at every seat at the table, all right? And, and until you've fired everybody around that, that table in, in your heart, Until God is sitting at every seat in the table, you're not allowing him to have that that place of honor, that priority that that he demands. No other gods but him. Uh, The second commandment is this. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind. I did a deep dive into the old Hebrew. There are exceptions for fantasy football trophies, so don't worry. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. We're we're okay here. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind. And and I want to encourage you today 
to remember what we've already talked about. In our culture today, the idols that we have are not necessarily, you know, handcrafted and, you know, hung on your mantle and you worship that idol. The idols that we struggle with are in our hearts. So you must not allow anything to replace the position where God demands to be in your heart. Don't make yourself an idol of any kind. Anything in your life where you are worshiping the created instead of the creator. That's the trap that we can fall into. I, I think the third command is, is equally important. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Uh, in other versions, it says you must not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I, you do a deep dive, like really this time, you do a deeper dive into that, and it, it, it speaks to the idea of you must not bear the name of God in vain. It's, it's much more than just saying, oh my God, or taking God's name in vain, not taking it seriously seriously, giving it the place of honor that he demands and deserves. It's not just taking the name of God, it's bearing the name of God in vain. And what that means is don't you dare profess to say, I follow Jesus, and then don't live that out in your life. I mean, that, that gets heavy. That's how I take the name of God. That's how I bear the name of God in vain. And so this is all really, really important as we set up this idea of idolatry. Like, hey, this is important to God. You see this in, in the Ten Commandments. You see this in the New Testament with the teachings of Paul. And in Moses' own journey, being the one who received the Ten Commandments, he is one of the two you know, great prophets that we see in the Old Testament. Moses and Elijah both, the, the reason that they got their fame, the reason they were great prophets was that each of them had moments where they stood up to idolatry. They said, this cannot be how we live. This cannot be our reality. This is not acceptable. We have to change our ways. And I love this. Uh, here at our Goshen campus, for everybody who's watching that's not here, we have a Thursday night service. Who's excited about the Thursday night service? Man, it's been awesome. We've got a great crew coming out. Thursdays have been awesome. Uh, if you're not able to come on Sundays, come the Thursday before. It's a great service. Um, I was not able to be here this Thursday. I set up Thursday night with, a, with five good minutes, a video that set up this sermon, and it was our very own, our pastor to families with kids. Anthony Senecal. That's who brought it on Thursday. Give it up for Pastor Anthony. He's our student ministry pastor. He is leading the charge with all of our students. And I wanted to give Anthony five good minutes today to bring what he brought because he has some great content. So in talking about Moses leading the charge against idolatry, I've invited Pastor Anthony to give us five good minutes. Would you welcome him to the stage as he brings what God has for him today? Thank you very much. Anthony, let's do this. Welcome, my man. Thank you, sir. Someday, if you play your cards right, your name, too, will be on that fantasy football trophy. All right, I came this it. close this year. I'm still mad about it. Uh, listen, yeah, I'm Pastor Anthony. I'm the student pastor here, and I got the chance to share the message Thursday night. Uh, so today, you'll just get the highlights, and I'll skip the bad jokes. We'll see. Uh, listen, Pastor Tim's right. Like, we don't worship little stone idols anymore, or golden calves, or something like that. Today, idols hide, and they hide in our hearts. Uh, the, the point that I want to start off with today is the idea that Satan has a specific strategic methodology to get us from the love of God to the worship of idols, right? Like, our temptation since creation is to stop believing that God's going to do what God told us he would do. We see it in the garden. Adam and Eve have been given so many promises that God's going to care for them. They're given dominion over all this land, these animals. They have food and all the provisions they could possibly need. But Satan plants a seed of doubt in Eve's mind, and she stops believing that God is going to do what God said he'd do. So then we flash forward to Moses. He and the people have been wandering the desert for years on their way to the promised land. And Moses encounters God on the mountaintop. He goes up Mount Sinai. He spends 40 days there just sitting in the presence of God. Like, imagine 40 days of this. <laughs> Some of us can barely handle one hour with each other. <laughs> imagine 40 days just sitting in the presence of God, and God walks him through every single thing he would need to know 
about how to lead the people from the desert to the promised land. He actually has like five or six straight pages of measurements of things to build that will help them in the process. Five pages. So if you'll open your Bibles, just kidding, we'll skip it. Moses spends those 40 days up on the mountaintop. He comes down. He's carrying the Ten Commandments he just got from God. And he hears it before he sees it, right? The people in the camp, the Israelites, they got bored while they were waiting for Moses. And when they got bored, they became anxious. And when they got anxious, they began to doubt God. And their doubt led them to worship idols. Moses comes down off the mountain holding the Ten Commandments after spending 40 days with God and getting all the information these people need. And they're worshiping idols. Moses gets so mad (laughs) that he takes the Ten Commandments that he just watched God carve with his finger and throws them across the camp. And they shatter into a million little pieces. Okay, this actually reminds me of a story. When I was like six years old, my dad would work transportation for Creation Music Festival, which if you don't know, is kind of like Lollapalooza for Christians, so less drugs, more homeschoolers. (laughs) And we get there, and he has a surprise for me. We're picking up a surprise guest after their concert and taking them back to their hotel. I don't know who it is. I'm sitting in the van, six years old, and he opens the door, and who walks in? But the Barlow girls. Yeah, you know, if you don't know who the Barlow girls are, they were like the it girls of early 2000s Christian music, okay? Like, every Christian girl I knew wanted to be them. Every Christian guy wanted to date them. They were really cool. So we're sitting, we're driving to where they're going. We're going to get ready to drop them off, and we get stopped by this huge crowd of Christian teenagers that realized the Barlow girls were in the van and wanted an autograph. So my dad pulls the van over, he gets out, he locks it. So it's me, six years old, in a van with the Barlow girls. This is my moment. (laughs) I was born for such a time as this. I reach down under my seat and I grab 1,000 Christian Jokes for Kids, (laughs) the book I had been carrying with me all week, and I begin to read my jokes. They do not think I'm funny. Like, at all. Until I get to this one joke. Who was the most wicked man in the Bible? So they list off Herod, Satan, Judas, all these people, and I say, no, no, no. Moses, because he broke all Ten Commandments at once. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. All right, have a good night. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So Moses comes down off the mountaintop after being in the presence of God and finds the Israelites worshiping idols. What happened was they got bored, they grew idle, I-D-L-E, and their idleness led them to anxiety, which led them to doubt, which led them to idols. I think today, our idleness leads us to idols. When we aren't up on the mountaintop, when we don't sit in the presence of God, when we're not connected in our church family, when we don't sit in worship or in scripture or in prayer, when we're not reaching people for Jesus and working to build the kingdom, we grow idle. And when we grow idle, we grow anxious. And when we grow anxious, we begin to doubt that God's going to do what he said he'd do, that the promises of God are good. And when we doubt, we go looking for things that we might trust more. We find ourselves worshiping idols. So my question for us today that I want us to just sit in is how many times have you encountered God in this room and then walked out those doors straight back to the idols you thought you left in here? And I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to feel shame. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. What I want to point out is that where we find idols in our heart might be a place where we haven't fully felt the love of God. So I'm going to pray for us. And then Pastor Tim's going to come back up and land the plane. 
God, I just ask that today we feel the power of your presence in this room. That we don't read about a mountaintop like it's a story. We experience what it's like to sit on the mountaintop with you. And we know that when we're on the mountaintop, our defenses, our frustrations that prevent us from experiencing more of you are brought down. And instead, we just feel your love. I ask today that if there's anybody in this room who needs to know how loved they are, that they're brought into your presence, but that someone has the chance to speak into them, to allow them to open up to the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's up for Anthony. Thank you, my man. That was awesome. Um, hey, that'll preach, right? Give it up for Anthony one more time. That's awesome. That's the guy that's pouring into our students, helping them become more like Jesus. Uh, fun fact before we get serious, uh, this is real life. Barlow Girl was a big deal. I mean, we're talking 18, 20 years ago, but they were a big deal. Uh, I took a youth group from Florida all the way up to Virginia. We did this big conference in the winter, and Barlow Girl was like the featured band in this big center. And uh, it turns out I was dressed exactly like the bass guitarist on their, on their stage. And afterwards, we all went out to eat, and we were like at this mall food court. And I kid you not, I took multiple pictures with people who thought I was the bass guitarist for Barlow Girl. Like, hey, you were great. Can we get our picture with you? Yes. Come on in. Hey. Uh, so I, I lived into that moment. I just want you to know that was fun. I did not correct them. They, it was their moment. I didn't want to ruin that. Um, can we get serious about this for a second, though? Uh, idols have the power in our lives because we allow them to absorb our hearts and imaginations more than God. I, I seek what I am looking for in, in the created instead of the creator. And, and I think it's time to identify which things in our lives have become idols and take the necessary steps to get rid of them. You have to ask yourself the question, what, what are you putting before God? I have to ask myself that question. What am I putting before God in my heart? What priority is out of line? And I think a lot of times these are uncomfortable moments because you realize, eh, I don't have it all together like I thought I did. And I got to be honest with you, that's okay. To come to that realization where God is speaking to you and convicting you and saying, hey, there's something I need to lay down in my life. Those are the beautiful and sacred moments where God meets us and helps us to become more like him. Don't, don't lean away from that moment. Lean into that moment. I think this is where we have to own it. And so in his book, Creatures of Habit, uh, Steve Poe gives four amazing uh, tools to use on, on how I can identify and win the battle over the idols in my life. And it all begins with this concept of owning it. I think number one is you have to work on your relationship with God. You have to make it up for yourself in your mind. God is going to be first in my life. Everything in my life that, that I'm pursuing, it has to filter through the lens of how is God wanting me to use this in my life? How is this going to glorify God? How am I going to utilize this, this facet of my life to live into the purpose and plan that God has for me? And if it's not filtering through that, if it's, if it's replacing that, it's got to be reorganized. It might have to be eliminated. If it's out of order, if it's the wrong priority, you have to focus on this reality that it is God first. Jesus said, Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things that we're searching for, they will be added to you as well. That, that's how it works. It, it has to be God first. Whatever Jesus is asking you to do, the answer has to be yes. It's that spirit of surrender. It's allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life and to give you the victory that he longs you to, for you to experience. It's God first. Number two, it's, it's setting boundaries. Listen, if something that isn't necessarily bad has crept into your life and it's just, it's, it's out of balance, set boundaries. I mean, some examples, like we're chasing after our careers and our jobs and our relationship with God is hurting, our relationship with our families are hurting. It, it's out of balance. Set boundaries. Uh, the activities that we do, we, man, I experience this. We're chasing our kids around with all the sporting events and there's no margin for anything. I don't have margin in my life to just stop and, and focus on Jesus and just to be quiet and to listen because everything else, all the busyness is drowning out the voice of God. Sometimes you just have to say no to some things so that God can have that highest seat in your life. Other examples, <laughs> this one's scary, cell phone time, like put limits. You're like, oh, Tim, now you've gone too far. Like, are you serious? How can I get on the gram and get likes? 
How will people ever know what I'm doing if I'm not constantly on Facebook or MySpace? <laughs> so, <laughs> you guys remember Tom? We were all friends with Tom for a while. <laughs> It's kind of scary. I mean, you could, don't do this now, but maybe later. Just kind of look at how much time you were on your cell phone last week and be amazed. Like, oh my goodness, I wasted so much time. And I would challenge you today, we, we just do this mindless amusement, which, by the way, make no mistake, amusement sounds like a fun word, but it literally broken down means no thought. Like, you are not thinking, not engaging. And we do so much amusement that it, it drowns out so many things that God could use us for. I, mean, I, I think many of us are going to regret all the time wasted on things that just didn't matter. Like, I don't have to convince you that the stuff we're scrolling through for hours doesn't matter, really. Think about all the things that God is calling you to do, how he is calling you to become someone he created for, for his purpose and to be in his image. All these things that we miss out on when we crowd Jesus out with all of these mindless things. And I think another piece of that is, is relationships. Uh, you got to identify there might be some relationships in your life that are unhealthy. They're, they're not leading you toward Jesus. They're leading you away from Jesus. You, you have to be willing to cut what shouldn't be there. And, and I challenge you, set boundaries. I, I think you have to prioritize confession and accountability. It, it's something I love about Crossroads. What I love about the church in general is we are a family. We are surrounded by people who are on the same journey. And, and at all of our campuses, uh, everywhere we gather, we have groups that you can get engaged with where you can have honest conversations. You can have accountability. We have amazing recovery ministries everywhere where you have people who will walk a long life with you and encourage you and hold you accountable. Sometimes we need to lean into those things. When we've found ourselves in areas of life where we know we are not so supposed to be. So leaning into those relationships, having that encouragement, prioritizing confession and accountability becomes so important. And the final, the final process here, the final piece, is you got to make hard choices. Because it's not easy. Like if an idol has crept into your life and you realize there's something in my life that has taken higher priority than it should. It's, it's replacing God in my life. That's a problem. And it's something that's that's important to you. Like you have emotional attachment to this thing and you've got to make a hard choice that there's something in my life that needs to be cut out. And this is not a new thing. I, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that walking with Jesus, becoming who he has called me to be, it's going to require me at different moments in my life to make the hard choices. And you know, I alluded to this earlier, Moses in the Old Testament, one of the great prophets, he had to call out the Israelites when they were worshiping the idol. Elijah is, is another one. These are the top two prophets that we see in the Old Testament. Elijah's moment of, of fame happens on the top of Mount Carmel. And on Mount Carmel, what has happened is all of Israel has turned away from God. They have begun to worship idols again. This was a cycle that they went through all throughout the journey of the Old Testament. They would have moments where they were close with God. Idols would creep into their lives. Their hearts would turn away from God. God would get their attention, and that's never fun. And they would turn back to God, and, and things would be good. They would just go through this cycle. And Elijah captures them at this moment where God is trying to get their attention. And it creeps in. In that moment, when, when Elijah gathers all of the prophets of Baal and Asher, there's 850 prophets that have gathered on this mountain. All the people of Israel have gathered around, and King Ahab is at the center of it. King Ahab, who had turned far from God. And what's crazy about Ahab is that he started out as a follower of God. He was on the right track. He was one of us. And what did he do? He married the wrong person. Let's just be honest. He married Jezebel. And listen, there's a reason there are no women that you know that are named Jezebel, all right? It, just, it still carries a bad, oh, she's a Jezebel. That's not a compliment, okay? <laughs> Jezebel was bad. She had all of these idols that she served, and she turned the heart of Ahab away from God, and he started worshiping these idols. And, and God had had enough. He got the attention of the Israelites and said, you gotta make a choice. And that's, that's the environment that Elijah walks into at the top of Mount Carmel. He's like the only guy left. He's like, I'm the only prophet of God left. You need to listen to what I'm going to say. And this moment happens where Elijah calls them out. In 1 Kings 18, 21, it says, Then Elijah stood in front of them, all these people, and said this, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God... 
If he is who he says he is, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Give him everything you've got. Just go for it. Follow him. And I think this is a moment in Elijah's mind where he thought it would be like uh, when Joshua called out the people of Israel, like, who are you going to serve today? As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Like the powerful moment in the life of Joshua, Elijah knows that this is how it went down for Joshua. In that moment for Joshua, the crowd went wild. They're like, yes, we will serve the Lord. It was like a rallying cry. Like before the game, they pumped up the music like, woo, we're in. I, I don't know. They were excited. And, and when Elijah says the same thing, like, who are you going to serve Stop wavering. Stop hobbling. It's crickets. No, no, it's like, and Elijah's going, what's going on here? What's a guy have to do? So he called down fire. That's what he did. But the reality is the question that he asks the people of Israel is the same question that God is asking us. It's the question I want to ask you today, man, this is, this is awkward. This gets real. There's different ways to phrase this. You see this in different translations of the Bible. In the New Living Translation, that's the one we use most here at Crossroads, it says, how much longer will you waver? Hobbling between two opinions. In another version, it says, how long will you waver? Limping between these two options. You're not living life to the full. You're not living the life that God has called you to if you're trying to serve two things. Jesus said, you can't do it. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other, or you're going to despise one and be devoted to the other. You, you, you can't serve two. You've got to pick one. And so many times we, we try to, to get on the fence and, and see, as mu- can I have as much of the, what the world's trying to offer me and also keep Jesus? That, that is a precarious place to be. You will never fully live into what God has for you. You will miss what God has for you. That will ripple into your life in negative ways that you would never imagine because that's not the life that God created you for. He's asking for all of us. He's asking for all of you. He's asking to be the highest priority in your life. And that is where life is lived to the fullest. That is where you will find what you're looking for. Can we just be clear today? We're surrounded by people who are desperate for hope. People are spending billions of dollars advertising and marketing in America, advertising all of these things that are trying to fulfill this promise in your life. You can find what you're looking for if you will chase after money. You can find what you're looking for if you'll chase after sex. You can find what you're looking for if you'll just seek the life of comfort. You can find what you're looking for if you've subscribed to Netflix for one year. It's not going to happen. I mean, next Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, you're going to see all the ads. They're going to be pushing hard, and not a single one of those things fulfills. Not a single one of those things offers what Jesus offers us. And yet these idols, they take this place in our heart where they eliminate the opportunity for us to live life to the fullest. They, they, they take away the opportunity to fully answer God's call for our lives. And make no mistake, God has a call on your life. You don't have to be a full-time pastor to have a call on your life. God created each of us in his image. What a, what a beautiful picture that we see all throughout the New Testament, specifically where it says God created you with gifts and abilities that he prepared for you from the beginning of time to do things that he created in advance for you to do. You all have a calling, every single one of us. And when we have the wrong priorities at the top of our heart, we miss out on that calling. We miss out on living life to the fullest. If you truly believe that Jesus is who he says he is, man, would you be willing to lay down the idol and give him everything that you've got? And this story is crazy because Elijah calls him out. There's silence. And then they just kind of make a deal. All right, you worship your God. I'll worship mine. The God who calls fire down from heaven is the God that we will serve. And all of these prophets start yelling and praying and crying out to Baal. They do this for hours. One of the reasons Elijah is one of my favorite prophets is because in the middle of all that, he's just sitting there kind of eating and just snacking and watching it. He's like, hey, pray a little louder. I don't think your God can hear you. (laughs) He's amazing. He literally says in the Bible, you read it yourself, maybe he's taking a bathroom break. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. (laughs) I love that. I love that. I feel like that would be me if that was me. (laughs) Because literally, Elijah's like one prayer, like drop it like it's hot. Boom, fire. (laughs) all these guys 
are, are, are doing everything they can. All these prophets of Baal, they're screaming out to their, their false God, to their idol. And what did they hear? Nothing. Nothing. Because you guys, when we worship nothing, it gives us nothing. And I don't want us to live life focusing on the wrong things, to waste our time worshiping things that give us zero in return. I think the biggest regret we could possibly have in life is, is getting to the end of life and realize that everything we invested our time and energy in, it was worthless. I want to challenge you today, man, if, if there's an idol in your life that God is asking you to lay down, like he's speaking to you right now, you know there's something that's out of balance in your life. You know that there's something you've allowed to take the place of God in your life. And you need to lay that down and be willing to make the hard choice today. Can I, can I just end by saying this? Idols always break their promises. There's never enough money. There's never enough attention. There's never enough pleasure that the world is going to offer you that, that is going to fulfill you. What you are looking for is in Jesus. It's scary. Jesus, I'm, I'm laying it all down. I'm going to follow you. It is you first. No other gods before you. But that is the life that we are all looking for. He is hope. He is joy. He is peace. I, want to, I just want to encourage you all to lean into that today. Be willing today to make the hard choice to, to lay down that idol. Because you can't serve two masters. So would you be willing today, just in this moment, to bow your head and close your eyes with me? And would you be willing just to take a moment to be real with yourself and just answer the question, what is the hard choice that God is asking me to make? What is the idol that I've allowed to creep into my life that is taking a higher priority in my life than God himself? Have I fallen into the trap of worshiping the created instead of the creator. And if, if God is speaking to you, like if in your mind you see something crystal clear, like I know this is the thing, would you be willing just to make the hard choice? And if God is asking you to lay something down, would you just be willing to say yes? Man, that is how our relationship with God grows. That's how we become who he created us to be. It's in the difficult moments, the hard choices, these beautiful and sacred opportunities that we have to interact with God where in obedience and in surrender, we make the hard choice and we lay down our idols at the feet of Jesus. Would you be willing to invite him into that space today? Invite him to take that highest seat of honor, that, that highest level of priority in your life, and commit today to worshiping him and him alone. You might be here today, and this is a little bit foreign to you. We're talking about having a relationship with Jesus and, and realizing that everything that I'm looking for is actually found in him. The world tells me I can find it chasing everything else, but that stuff never delivers. It never satisfies, and you're realizing that's my experience I've been chasing my identity. I've been chasing money. I've been chasing sex. I've been chasing fame and fortune. And it's not fulfilling. It's not what I thought it was. I want you to know today that if you've never said yes to Jesus, when you say yes to him, he changes everything. He is what you are looking for. And so while sometimes we have to make really hard choices, let me encourage you today that, man, the easiest choice, the best choice that you could possibly make is to say yes to Jesus for the very first time, to invite him into, into your life, to, for, to forgive you and to set you free because he is what you are looking for. He loves you with an extravagant love. And so as we come to a close today, I'm just going to ask all of us to stand together. And if you need to pray that prayer to say yes to Jesus for the first time, as we all stand together, I would invite you to say this prayer with all of us as we invite Jesus into our lives to forgive us and to set us free. Can we say this prayer together? Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the Savior of the world, that you gave your life to forgive my sins, and that God raised you from the grave so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for loving me. I am saying yes to you, Jesus. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. And can we give him praise? There is no one like our God. Can we give him the glory? Because he loves us with an extravagant love. And I just want to challenge you today, Crossroads. 
leave here today having made the hard choice. You will never regret saying yes to Jesus every single day. Every time he asks you to lay something down, say yes. You will find yourself living your life to the fullest, living into your purpose, living into your calling, living the life that you were created for. Don't hold back. It's scary. Make the hard choice. And if you need somebody to walk alongside you, man, you are surrounded by people who will encourage you and accountable. Come talk to one of the the pastors on our staff. Come talk to me. We'll get you plugged in. We want to help you be successful and live that life that God has called you to. And listen to me. Next Sunday, it's Super Sunday. And it's not super because there's a football game. Let's just be real. It'll be a letdown. I promise you. It'll probably be a blowout. It won't even be worth watching, except for all those commercials that they're lying to you, telling you to buy stuff that'll fulfill you that won't. But I, I, I digress. Super Sunday is going to be amazing because we're baptizing all kinds of people next Sunday. Lives that have been changed by Jesus. People who said, yes, I am going to follow him. And I have to challenge you today. If you have said yes to Jesus, if you have said, I am going to follow you, and you've never been baptized, join us. Let us celebrate what God is doing in your life, the the commitment that you have made, because it changes everything. And I want to encourage you guys, take advantage of the opportunity to invite someone to join you, because I guarantee you, There is someone in your life who's been chasing the idols, chasing all these things that don't actually fulfill, and they are desperate for the hope that we have in Jesus. So as you leave the day, having laid down your idol, would you live with just eyes open, recognizing who in your life needs an invitation to a changed life? And next week, let's celebrate in a big way, not only lives that have been changed, but let's celebrate people who say yes to Jesus for the very first time. That's why we do what we do, and I cannot wait to see how that's going to unfold. We're going to have a blast, and lives are going to be changed. It doesn't get better than that. That's why it is Super Sunday. I can't wait for it. So here's the thing. I want, to, I want to close in prayer. We're going to sing one more song, a beautiful song that just, it displays the gratitude that we have for God who loves us with an incredible love, the God who we can trust with everything. So let's pray. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Let's sing this song together, and then we'll be dismissed. God, I just thank you so much for the love that you have for us, for who you are. Because, God, there is no one like you. You are. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And and you demand and you deserve the, the highest place of honor, the highest place of priority in our lives. So, God, help us not to hold back. Help us to resist the urge to do life on our own terms. God, just just may it be you first in our lives. And when you speak to us, God, may, may those hard choices become easier. May we stop resisting and just say, God, whatever it is you're asking for, every day, the answer is yes. Believing that, that you will provide, that you are faithful, that, that you are enough. So God, we, we thank you. We praise you and we give the glory because you deserve it. We pray this in your name. And together we say, amen.